All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, we're ready to start the next session. Uh, but before we do, just a quick announcement about the banquet. The banquet will be here, uh, downstairs, where we had uh, lunch on the first day before they moved us outside. And everyone's welcome. So our first speaker is Slava Dobrovitsky. And he will tell us about quantum dynamics and quantum control of spins and diamond. Yeah, so, yes, thank you very much for coming, for finishing lunch early, coming to my talk. So I will be talking about a few things we have done with our theoretical collaborators, with my former postdoc, Jihui Wang, who is now working with Daniel. Uh, with the group of Ronald Hansen from Technical University of Delft and from with a group of David Ashalom, two hours away from here. So recently there has been a lot of interest uh, in individual quantum spins and solid state. And people have studied a lot, and some of the systems are probably known to you. These are quantum dots, which have which been popular, very popular the last few years. Uh, donors in silicon, where they finally achieved the uh, uh, ability to work with a single uh, donor center. And the uh, subject of my talk, and this center in diamond. So why do we care about individual spins in solid state, well, for obvious reasons. Because uh, they're good for at least small to medium scale quantum information processing. They are good for coherent, coherent spintronics and photonics, and this is probably very, the most fast growing area of their potential applications. High precision metrology and magnetic sensing at nanoscale, again, huge area with very, very impressive potential applications. But of course, as always, we are facing a grand challenge, how to control single quantum spins and solids. And for this, we need to solve quite a few fundamental problems to understand dynamics of individual quantum spin, to understand how to control it, how to preserve its coherence, and how to generate and preserve entanglement between quantum spins. And for all these, so this is the picture which in the shows what we want to do. We want to be able to pick up a single spin in solid state, do whatever we want, and uh, ever we want. And spins and diamond, they constitute an excellent test bed for this. They have long coherence time. They're individually addressable and controllable both optically and <laughs> magnetically. And at our disposal, we have an excellent menu of dynamical decoupling protocols. And just to start with the traditional mm, introduction, usually they are analyzed and classified using Magnus expansion um, when we have terms of zero order, first order, second order, and so on, assuming that the uh, distance between the dynamical decoupling pulses is very small. And the simplest one is periodic dynamical decoupling, where when we wait, apply pulse, wait, apply pulse, tau x, tau x. We can symmetrize it, so there has been a lot of introduction. So we can have this TPMG protocol, wait, apply pulse, wait twice, apply pulse, wait. And we can concatenate them, put them inside each other, like this Russian dolls, and achieve more impressive protocols. However, uh, for any, probably for any theorist who starts working with experimentalists, there is a moment of truth when uh, you realize that whatever all these fancy and beautiful theories you're doing, they're totally useless and you have to deal with something much more mundane, something like pulse errors or the fact that this generator doesn't have enough dynamical range and all your beautiful suggestions, they either go down the drain or you have to do something else. So, so what are the problems with the standard approach? First, we always hear about the norm of certain Hamiltonians. Well, in reality, 
all these norms grow with the size of the bar. So whenever we write this beautiful expression, norm of h multiplied by tau, don't forget that this is essentially infinite. And it is not small parameter, it's actually infinite parameter. Second, uh, validity conditions in reality are not satisfied because the ultraviolet cutoff is usually too large. But still, well, no DD works. Behavior at long times is not quite clear because again, of this <coughs> nature of the cumulant expansion and the accumulation of pulse errors and imperfections is also not well understood. So this is why we have to usually do some numerical stuff to really help ex experimentalists and assess how the codes will perform in reality. And uh, so we can do it this way or that way and often we can do much simpler thing. They're maybe not as impressive from point of view, but they produce really good results, such as mean field techniques. So, what will be my talk about? First, about quantum control and dynamical decoupling of NV center. Uh, there lately has been spectacular progress. There were three papers published in different journals, probably within the time span of one month or so, at least. I remember how Ronald called me at some point and said that Corey put the paper on archive and we had to put our paper on archive. So, so it was, but it was fun. Uh, second, how to do decoherence protected quantum gates. And I will demonstrate you decoherence protected quantum algorithm in solid state. And correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, this is the first two qubit quantum computation with individual solid state spin which we finally achieved. So, what are the characters in this story? The simplest impurity in diamond is a substitutional nitrogen. We take away carbon, we put nitrogen instead, we have one excess spin, so there is a spin one half. And these guys, green guys are bad, they constitute our spin bath, our environment, which decoheres us, and, and they're coupled to each other with long-range dipolar coupling. But when nitrogen meets vacancy, the transformation happens, good, bad guy becomes a good guy. We have this beautiful nitrogen vacancy center, which is our central spin system or our qubit. Uh, the, gr uh, the red one is the electron spin, which we're after. It's a, actually, it's a spin of two holes, so the total spin is one. And there is also a nuclear spin of nitrogen 14, it will be nuclear spin one, or nitrogen 15, spin one half. And they're coupled on site, and it will play important role later. And NV center is coupled via the polar interaction to a large number of nitrogens. So what's so good about NV center? It can be initialized, manipulated, and read out, optically and magnetically. So we can look at a single individual spin in solid state. So why is it possible? There is a very interesting and not even completely understood level diagram, but uh, to make a long story short, we have spin one. We have three sublevels, zero plus one minus one. Zero sublevel, if we shine a photon on it, it gets excited to the excited state, stays there for 10 nanoseconds, and falls back and emits a photon. So every time, photon in, photon out, photon in, photon out. But if we're in one of those states, we can be excited, then make what is called in this quantum chemical jargon inter-system crossing, and we get stuck in this shelving state for a long, long time, for 300 nanoseconds, almost infinity. So, and even when we come back, we come back first to M equals zero state. So we started here, but eventually we came back here. And when there is a transition from here to here, no visible photons are emitted. So if we're in M equals zero, photon in, photon out, photon in, photon out. If we're in these two states, photon in, nothing. So, and even when there's nothing over, we're polarized in M equals zero state with typical polarizations of order of 90% or higher, which is, so, initialization and redoubt simply by shining a green laser. Nothing else is needed. 
Now, let's look at the coherence. So here we have this nitrogen vacancy center. We apply some magnetic field. We forget about this level, minus one. It's not of interest for us, it's an idle. And here is our qubit. And we have box pins, nitrogen atoms. But because of the different parameters, this resonant frequency is very different from the frequency of this transition. So what we're dealing with is a pure dephasing. There is just effective level splitting between these two qubit levels. And there is some operator which describes time-dependent action of the bath on the <coughs> on a qubit. Purely dephasing term. Now, how to deal with this? Of course, if we want to make our, if we want to be completely honest, it's a many-body, quantum, non-equilibrium problem, which we have no way to address uh, analytically, at least unless we have some good parameters, which we don't in this case. But uh, in this particular case, it appears that due to the fact that our bath feels negligible back action from the central spin, we can re replace the field created by the bath as a, just as a random C number field which is Gaussian, stationary, and Markovian noise, or the Nullenbeck process, which is characterized by two parameters only. Strength of the noise, B, which is determined by the spin bath coupling between NV and the bath of nitrogens. And the correlation time, which is determined by the coupling between nitrogens, between green spins. And we can do direct many spin modeling. We can run simulations with 20 spins, we can run simulations with 10,000 spins. And again, to make long story short, we just can confirm that indeed this very simple model is good enough, is adequate for our experiments. Here is the correlation function. Here is what we get for spin echo, uh, just taking numerical simulation and versus analytical model free evolution. So as you see, agreement is very good. So qubit in a Gaussian, in a Gaussian stationary Markovian mean field. Now, <coughs> just to be, to complete this story, we can look at the experimental free decoherence. This is red dots are experiment, gray line theory. We can extract C2 star time and Therefore, we can extract the coupling of the qubit to the environment. Here you, you see modulation of induction signal. It is because of hyperfine coupling of the nuclear spin. Next, just to make sure that our mean field model is indeed correct, we can do spin echo. And we see that it indeed decays as theory predicts, e to minus t cube uh, decay. And the correlation time of the bath is 25 microseconds which is long enough for us to do dynamical decoupling. So, so our first step, quantum control and dynamical decoupling, extending coherence time of a single NV center. First, of course, since nobody has done it on NV centers before us, the question was always which protocol to choose from this plethora of protocols. And we started analyzing one after another, First, we started with PDD, like simplest protocol, the most obvious choice, and we ran into the problem right away. It at short times, it decays four times faster than we would like to. Only at longer times, it becomes here, instead of four thirds, we have one third. So it's good, it's simple, but unfortunately, it decays fast initially, not what we want. So let's try CPMG. It appears that CPMG has this slow decay at all times. Beautiful. Now, of course, we want to try to concatenate it. And we see that fast decay at all times if we concatenate PDDs. And if we concatenate CPMGs, slow decay at all times and no improvement. Absolutely no improvement, which means that we will be just programming a more difficult sequ sequence without any actual, any advantage. Yes. So why? 
Well, first of all, it's kind of obvious statement, but I want to reiterate it, that coherence time can be extended well beyond 25 microseconds, well beyond the uh, correlation time of the bus. Second, Magnus expansion is, gives us completely wrong predictions because instead of this decay for PDD or for CPMG, we have, instead of tau to the fourth, we have tau to the cube. Symmetrization or concatenation gives no improvement and simply because we have Ornst null and back noise with a heavy tail one over omega squared. Second moment of this noise is formally infinite and it corresponds to what I started with. That the uh, uh, norm of the Bath Hamiltonian is infinite. Actually, it's not quite infinite, but it's at five gigahertz and it's much faster than anything, any other time scale in our exper experiments. So, <coughs> we know the protocol, CPMG. We start running it and we immediately see that X component is protected very well and Y component is not protected very well. So, what's wrong? The answer is also obvious, control pulses are not perfect. And it's actually interesting to see why they are not perfect. When we're trying to control our NV center with the actual experimental situation, you see that during the whole pulse we have only one, two, three oscillations. And we have a ring down. So again, all this beautiful uh, rotation, fra rotation frame approximation Uh, so all this beautiful rotation frame approximation is inapplicable. If we have very uh, slow driving, then we indeed see what we expect, to see beautiful Rabi oscillations of the spin. But when the driving becomes stronger, because this is what we need to achieve very short pulses, you see that we don't have these beautiful nice oscillations. Instead of we have kind of spin stalls in some state, then quickly jumps to another, from up to down, stays there for a while, jumps halfway, then stay and shows the sequence of fast jumps and stalls. So, and this is not a experimental noise, as you see it's reproduced completely by simulation. This is just what happens when we try to drive our spin very fast. And of course, it introduces a lot of errors in the pulses, and we need to characterize them. So we did some work, how uh, develop the scheme for characterization of the pulse errors. Then we should study how the errors accumulate. We also did that, and we saw some interesting stuff. I hope Kavi will talk more about this. So, again, I'm sorry. Bottom line is that. If we apply pulses along X, X component is preserved well, Y not. But if we apply pulses along X and Y and use this XY4 sequence which was introduced yesterday, <coughs> we see that X and Y are protected well and coherence time is indeed extended. So here you see that the coherence time is in the region of about seven millisecond, although we started with two. Good. We can look at other aperiodic sequences, UDD, QDD. So what do we see? Well, first we do not expect them to work very well because we have no hard cutoff in the buff. And indeed they do not perform as well as we expected. But there is a deeper problem with them if we look at the robustness to the pulse errors. And here are the simulations with uh, imperfect pulses, whether the parameters of every pulse are taken from experiment. So, as you see, still XY4 performs much better than QDD and of course incompar incomparably bet better than UDD. So, robustness to pulses plays an important role. <coughs> but, again, if we choose our protocol correctly, if we take into account the errors, and if we do things clear, very in a clean manner, then we see exactly what theory predicts. And what does it predict? First, 
for any number of pulses, the decay should have this form, e to minus t cubed. So if we take spin echo, four pulses, eight pulses, 136 pulses, and rescale them, they should fall on the same master curve, and this is exactly what you see. And if we measure the coherence time as a function of the number of pulses, it should demonstrate n to the two-thirds. And again, this is exactly what experiment shows. So applying 136 pulses, coherence is increased by a factor of almost 30. We achieved 90 microseconds, which is great. And well, actually, I wrote here no limit inside. We're limited at this time scale. We started being limited by T1 processes. So we're practically pushed dynamical decoupling to the limit. But this is what, happens, what happened last year. Since then, we were doing some other things, using dynamical decoupling to improve single spin magnetometry or to do the detailed probing of the mesoscopic spin bath, which surrounds a single NV center. So we take a single center and study around 10 spins, which, are, which form an effective bath for this particular center. So essentially, again, uh, it gives us ability to study mesoscopic spin dynamics. But this is only half of the story. Protecting <coughs> spins is good, but we want to do something useful with them. And for this, we need many NVs to talk to each other, to process the information in some way. And there were one particularly uh, useful ways to make NVs talk to each other is to use hybrid systems. And hybrid systems are very popular now because, <coughs> because they combine best features of different uh, qubits which we know about. So here in particular uh, there are suggestions to put NVs on cantilevers and use the nanomechanical oscillators as data bus between the NV centers. There's been a suggestion to use spin chains, but the simplest one which you can think of and the most probably widespread is when we use electron spin as a processor for quantum information and nuclear spin as a memory. So anyway, we have many spins and they decohere. We want to do something useful with them. So, if we think about standard mode of quantum operation, of course, it doesn't work. What we can do is unprotected quantum gate, but then again protected. Or we can do protected storage, but then we kill the coupling not only between the different qubits, of which have different time scales, but also between our qubit and the bot. So we can efficiently preserve the state. We can efficiently isolate our NV center but in order to perform some interesting computation, we need to change this state. We need to keep electron spin, for instance, talking to the nuclear spin. This is what we want to achieve. And to do this, we need to be able to combine dynamical decoupling pulses with the gate operation in a seamless fashion. So decouple and compute at the same time. And again, since we're dealing with hybrid system, different qubits have very different coherence and control time scales. So our electron, we, we start decoupling our electron, nuclear spin just barely starts to move. So by the time the electron spin decoheres, nuclear spin just started rotating. If we, <coughs> so if we try to control the nuclear spin, it takes much longer than the electron decoherence time. So we have essentially the choice. Either decouple the electron, apply dynamical decoupling, but then no gates possible because we decouple it from the nucleus. Or we can do gating without dynamical decoupling, but then again, we don't have any gates. So there is, of course, I wouldn't talk about this if there was no way out. And the way out is to use the resonance in the system. This, but I don't know, for this talk I called it guard. Gates with resonant decoupling. So, look at our system in more detail. 
In a rotating frame, this is the Hamiltonian, which describes it. SZ is a very fast decohered electron spin. I is the very, very slow, barely moving nuclear spin. So you can see, for instance, that here we have two megahertz hyperfine coupling, but the driving we apply to the nuclear spin is only 18 kilohertz. And this is a very typical figure. So let's look what happens in a rotating frame. If the electron spin is in a state one, as z equals one, and we nuclears rotating around z, because this term kills that one. If the electron is in a state zero, this term is absent, we have only driving. The nucleus slowly, slowly rotates around the x-axis. So the only problem here is that the electron switches very fast between zero. This is the essence of dynamical decoupling. And <coughs> but the nuclear spin should keep track of what was the electron state long before we started decoupling. At first sight, it's kind of contradictory, but in fact, if we look at the motion of the nuclear spin, if we start from the state zero, it will be zero pulse on the electron spin, so the electron spin will be zero, one, one, zero. If we start at the electron spin in the state one, it will be state one, zero, zero, one. And in general, the Hamiltonians are different, but these rotation axes for the nuclear spin, they're closed. They're very close to each other, simply because they're both close to the z-axis. This is just a formal expression. So you see that uh, the product is almost one, minus some small parameter. And fortunately, resonance, when this something becomes small, and to understand what happens at this case, we can just look at the how spin rotates. In this case, we have, during the time tau, we have exactly half a rotation around the z-axis. So if we started with the electron in the state one, it rotates pi around z, then x around the x-axis, and then another pi around z. So as a result, we have minus x of the nuclear spin. If the electron started in the state zero, then we have rotation around x, full rotation around z, which does nothing, and then again rotation around x. So our out state is plus x. That's it, that's a resonance. And now we can do something good. But first we should understand that the resonance is narrow. Here is just the graph of these functions I showed before. Timing jitter should be less than one nanosecond over 100 microsecond time span. So this is very uh, precise requirement should be satisfied to do this. If we are, uh, make an error by 10 nanoseconds, the fidelity drops to 90% already. But beauty, there is also a beautiful thing that if we're in this resonance, we do nuclear spin conditional rotation. But if we're exactly um, integer number of full rotations away from the resonance, then we have unconditional nuclear spin rotation, which is not interrupted by interaction with the electron. So we can do all nuclear gates only by changing the interpulse time delay. And first proof of concept, it first is protected controlled rotation gate and here you see if the electron starts in the spin one, the nucleus oscillates around the x-axis. But if we are in the state zero, then nucleus stays in place and shows only a little bit of T1 decay. And this is the mm, state tomography, which shows us that the fidelity of the state, of the Bell state created in this way, is 97%. Although we are mm, about 10 times longer than the electron decoherence time, free induction decay time. Now, we can do something more interesting. T2 star is just a dephasing. We can show that we can go beyond the T2 time and do still high fidelity gates. So what's been done here, T2 50 microsecond, gate time is also longer. What we want to do is to create the Bell state. 
And again, we can do it with four decoupling pulses on the electron, eight decoupling, 16 decoupling pulses on the electron. But and the only thing we need, we need to care about is keeping precisely the resonance condition. And when we do it, you see for 16 pulses, we're doing in the same way as if no decoherence was present here. So good. So we have a working gate. We decoupled the electron. We created decoherence protected gate for the nuclear spin. We're doing it on a time scale which is twice larger than T2. So let's do some algorithm. Let's, oops. Let's see. I'm not sure if it's the right one, but. Yes, it works. Good. So we can take two qubits. We have electron spin and the nuclear spin. Grover's algorithm converges in one iteration, but still, if we look at the total time needed to perform the algorithm, it is 300 microseconds. And our T2 time is only 250 microseconds. So this is the block diagram, and this is exactly the scheme of the pulses applied in the elect electron channel and in the nuclear channel. I just told we just keep driving very slowly with very sl small driving. And we just keep the, adjust the distance between the electron decoupling pulses, either in number or half integer number of rotations. And, yes. If we look at the Grover's algorithm, for instance, if we want our target state is one up, we obtain it with a fidelity 95%. And here are just the experimental snapshots of different stages of the Grover algorithm. First, we prepare the equal superposition, flip, do the, uh, the inversion, flip again, and restore the state. So the fidelity for the target state one up is 95%. For the other states, it's 93, 92, 91. But in all cases, we're above we're above 90%. Although, again, our algorithm time is 60% longer than the spin echo. So high, we, we achieve high fidelity beyond coherence, which is great. So just as a conclusion, that diamond-based quantum information processing becomes competitive because what not only our work, but in general, the community working in this area demonstrated already spin photon entanglement, protected gates, and dynamical decoupling. So we have all three crucial ingredients, at least for small scale quantum information processing. Coherence time can be extended. We show 25 fold uh, enhancement. Other people show comparable figures. Dynamical decoupling can be efficiently combined with gates. And we can even do uh, protected algorithms at the times which exceed T2 time, spin echo time, with a fidelity above 90%. And just as a side note, I think it's nice that this was the first two qubit computation on individually addressed state spins. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Slava, for finishing five minutes earlier. It got us back on schedule. Uh, but we do have some time for questions. So maybe it sounds stupid, but uh, what if you wanted to go beyond T1? Mm, we need to decouple phot phonons. Mm, in principle, it can be done. In principle. But there are other ways to beat that limit. So just right now, it's not the, the, it's not the actual limit because by lowering temperature even to 20K, you have T1 in minutes, a order of minutes. So this is, oh yeah, I probably, I'm sorry, I forgot to 
say the most important thing. This is all done at room temperature. This is, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is, <laughs> I was giving this talk to kind of mostly uh, diamond audiences and um, I forgot to mention the crucial thing. This is all room temperature. So essentially what you have, you have just an objective, one laser and a piece of diamond which you can buy for $40. And that's it, you have a quantum computer. No, I'm serious, I'm not joking. Well, yes, you need microfabrication lab somewhere, yes. How many carats diamond is this? Oh, uh, it's about this big, about a couple of millimeters by couple of millimeters. But don't show it to anybody, it's very ugly. It's, it looks like a piece of old plastic. It has a lot of nitrogen in it, it's yellow. This is very nice. So how about uh, you go to like more than two qubits? What would be the perspective? Uh, uh, more than two qubits? Yeah. Well, again, first we can, uh, there is a very successful effort, which recently also there was a Nature Physics published last year, where people were able to place two, and well, place maybe. Okay, there were two NV centers which were close enough to appreciably interact via dipolar interactions, but at the same time far enough to be resolved optically. So there has been already a demonstration of two dipolar coupled individually addressable NV centers. Actually, if I had my computer, I even have uh, a little slide on this because we did the simulations for this, and we also show that we can go far, far beyond T2 time also. So the coherence protected gates can be done in this for, case. For that too. case, is it also room temperature? That's uh, limited by no, T1 or no, T2 no, time? No, 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 I think it was something like 50 kilo. I'm not sure. Oh, Let it's me. It's but it can be a room temperature as well. Mm -hmm. the, for this system, mm, the difference is in T1, nothing else. And maybe let me add one more. There has been spin photon entanglement demonstrated last year. So just entangling, probabilistic entanglement between two NVs is just a matter of time. Whoever does it first actually does. Mm -hmm. Yes? So why do you use this ugly diamond with lots of nitrogen and not a clean one with uh, very few nitrogens? <coughs> well, we use the clean one too. The one with 250 microsecond coherence time, it was a clean one. But it doesn't really matter we can do well cases. Yeah, but if you want to get long coherence time, it's easier. With yes, we did uh, this, w the one with, uh, where the algorithm was done, 250 microseconds. It was a clean one, yes. Well, you still need to decouple car carbon-13 spins. So, we, you cannot go without decoupling anyway. Okay, uh, thanks again.